Captain, Spiro, Pilote, L'Echo de Savance, Harakiri, Charlie Hebdo, Metal Erlan, Anana. In today's episode, we'll follow Bande Dessine from The Adventures of a Boy and His Dog to Screaming Metal, the adolescence of Franco Belgian comics into L'Age Adult. I'm Andrea Gilroy, and this is Comics Crash Course. When last we left our story, World War II had ended and Franco-Belgian comics were free to express themselves again. In the immediate aftermath of the war, however, despite being second in the Franco-Belgian appellation, Belgium became central to comics publishing. This was in part because Belgium was not quite as devastated as France was by Nazi occupation. Several BD artists, in fact, were able to continue publishing during the war. As we discussed last week, Hergé was one of them. The Belgian journal Spiro managed to stay open until paper shortages closed it near the end of the war as well. After the war, Spiro returned with vigor. The eponymous series, created by André Franken, took off with Gigé at the helm. In 1946, it was joined by Morris's Lucky Luke. And that same year, 46, Hergé founded Tintin, moving his series from newspapers to its own magazine. Further cementing Belgium's status as the center of BD was France's Loi du 16 juillet 1949 sur les publications destinées à la jeunesse, or the Law of July 16, 1949, on publications aimed at youth. Officially, it was meant to protect children from dangerous, violent, and sexual images. Unofficially, imported U.S. comics were crushing the French comics market. They were not only more popular, but American comics were not playing on the same level. You see, French publishers were still dealing with paper shortages and the economic devastation of the war, and they just couldn't compete with the glossy, slick comics coming from the States. Solution? Ban them, based on morality laws. And it worked! Outside of Le Journal du Mickey, which reappeared in 1952, pretty much all American comics disappeared from France throughout the 1940s and 50s. But, just like the Comics Code in the U.S., this morality law put some pretty restricting guidelines on French creators. As Anne Miller explains in Reading Bande Dessinée, the law, which still is in effect today, by the way, quote, prohibits the publication of material destined for young people, which presents immoral or criminal behavior in a positive light, or which might otherwise demoralize young people. It also prohibits the display of violent or licentious material, whether or not it is intended for young people in places where minors might be exposed to it, thereby allowing for censorship to be exercised over adult publications. And that's pretty harsh. Meanwhile, Bandesine in Belgium in particular was growing along a fault line. Practitioners tended to fall into either the Brussels School, which was associated with the journal Tintin, and hence the clear line style, or the Charleroi School, which was associated with the comic dynamic style and the journal Spiro. Members of the Brussels School included, of course, Hergé, but also Paul Couvelier, best known for Corentin, Jacques Martin, the creator of Alex, Willy Vandersteen, the beloved artist of Bob et Bobette, and Edgar Jacobs of Blake at Mortimer. The Charleroi School stars were the aforementioned Gigé and Morris, as well as André Franken, who found success again with Gaston Lagaffe, Maurice Tillieu, creator of Gil Jordan, and Peyo, who I'm sure that you know. His series Les Strumpfs is better known as the Smurfs in the US. The comic dynamic style sort of does what it says on the tin. It's energetic, and cartoony, and full of dynamism. Clearline can be those things, but it often gives up some of that dynamism for readability and accessibility. In 1959, René Goscinny, Alberto Uderzo, and Michel Charlier, already beloved comics creators, as well as a group of radio personalities from Radio Luxembourg, founded Pilote, a new magazine aimed toward teens instead of towards children. Family-friendly by the nature of French law, Pilot still worked to cultivate talented artists willing to embrace satire. And its most famous series is Asterix, written by Goscinny and illustrated by Uderzo. If there is a BD series to rival Tintin, 
the adventures of Asterix the potion swigging Gaul and his best buddy Obelix might just be it. Beginning in 1959, Asterix is still running today, though now it's being written by Jean-Yves Ferry and drawn by Didier Conrad. In 1963, Michel Charlier joined with the artist Jean Giraud, better known as Mobius, on the Western adventure story Blueberry. Morris would move Lucky Luke from Spiro to Pilote in 1967. And that same year, Pierre Christine and Jean-Claude Mézières' sci-fi series Valerian and Laureline would launch, and that would run until 1985. The more sophisticated storytelling and art in Pilote helped cement an adult readership for Bande dessinée, even though censorship was, of course, still an issue. And by the 1960s, BD began to achieve cultural legitimacy and receive academic attention, especially in France. In 1962, the Club Bande Dessinée, or CBD, began publishing an influential review titled Gif With. The CBD would later change its name to the Centre d'Études des Littératures d'Expression Graphique, or CELEG, and would hold the first Bande Dessinée Salon in 1965. And in 1966, Bande appreciation got so real that there were academic spats. La Société Civile des Etudes, et, mm, I'm just going to say soccer lid, splintered off from Seleg and held the first museum exhibition dedicated to Bande in 1967. The 1960s also saw the first academic books dedicated to Bande with sociologist Evelyn Soulerot's Bande Dessinée et Culture, in 1966, and graphic designer and professor Gérard Blanchard's Histoire de la Bande Dessinée in 1969. By the late 1960s, French society was in transition, culminating with the May 1968 uprisings. This push toward greater political and individual freedom, of course, also manifested in the world of Bande Dessinée. In 1960, the self-proclaimed brutish and nasty satirical magazine Arakiri was founded by Georges Bernier, Cavana, and Fred Aristides. It wasn't only comics, but Aristides was a well-known bande dessinée artist whose series Philemon ran in Pilote. Editorial cartoons and comics were part of Arakiri's satire. In response to being shut down for mocking the funeral of Charles de Gaulle, Arakiri created a new magazine called Charlie Hebdo, which continued running side by side with Arakiri once that magazine restarted. Charlie Hebdo was also a weekly satire magazine, though it's better known for its cartoon and comics than Arakiri was and perhaps in the U.S. as best known these days for the deadly terror attacks of 2015 and the subsequent discussions about the magazine's content. Those discussions are complex and difficult enough that I would encourage you to do your own research because it could probably take up its whole own episode. In 1972, Nikita Mandrika, Marcel Gottlieb, and Claire Bretache had reached the limits of their frustration with the restrictions mandated by Pilot's adolescent audience and editorial standards. They wanted a magazine which could explore longer format stories, self-contained stories, and would also allow them the freedom to address issues of sex and violence and drugs and other adult issues in Bande dessinée. The result? L'Echo des Savannes. It was the first French magazine to carry a for adults only warning on its cover, and of course, because of the previous law I mentioned, had difficulty selling in many of the places that could sell Bande dessinée. It was, however, very popular and hugely influential. And despite the cartoony look you see on these covers, Leco included both funny gag-style comics and more serious stories as well. When Mandrika, Gottlieb, and Bretaché defected from Pilote, Jean Giraud realized he wasn't really achieving his full artistic potential. And this is when he began to use the pseudonym Mobius more seriously and started to submit stories, especially sci-fi stories, to Pilot and Leco in a completely different style from his work on Blueberry. With the help of Mandrika, Mobius founded a new publishing house called Les Humanoids Associés. Their banner publication would be a magazine dedicated to science fiction and fantasy bande dessinée, Metal Erdon. It's better known in the U.S. as heavy metal, though it's directly translated as screaming metal. In January 1975, the first issue hit stands. Women creators were also part of this movement. I've mentioned Claire Bretaché, who was a major figure in Pilote and Leco. Metal Erlan also published women artists, but that magazine, if you've experienced it all, you might know, features some sexist material that tended to alienate women creators. 
1976, inspired by Trina Robbins' women's comics movement, the Humanoids began publishing Anana, an all-women's bande ciné magazine featuring artists including Nicole Clevelou, Chantal Montelier, Florence Sestac, and Olivia Clavel. It not only featured comics by women creators, but also highlighted women in comics history and covered media created by women and for women. L'âge adult du Bidi, this is often called, reached its apex with a sleeve, a journal claiming to be, quote, a wild invasion of bande dessinée into literature. So what happened next? Gotta wait until next time. See you then.